Welcome to our podcast. My name is Keely Severson and I'm here with Alicia Swamy and Eric Johnson and together we are Exposing Mold. Today we are interviewing May Dooley. Welcome, May. Thank you. It's nice to be with you. May, I, I'm a bit familiar with some of the services that you offer. You do some mold sampling for people in the mold injured community. Could you tell us more about your work? Yes, I started this work before mold was known to the public in 1994. In fact, my accountant had just said, I think you better look for a job. And the, the big lawsuit in Texas uh, put mold on the map. And that was around 2000. Um, and I've been uh, in it ever since. But the way it started, I had a, a course of study um, that dealt with more than mold. It dealt with uh, gas leaks, uh, electromagnetic fields, and so on. But the way I started with mold was with a microscope. Um, I'm a former science teacher, so I'm aware of a microscope, although I have had to teach myself because there were and are no classes on studying mold in houses. Um, I've put up information uh, from a microscope standpoint, I should say that, of course. Um, I put up information on a new website uh, because um, I've come to, come to the conclusion that uh, people have to do it for themselves. They've got to take responsibility for their own lives because the industry is uh, geared towards other things such as um, lawsuits. Uh, so I started off um, my first inspection. I brought tapes back to look at under the microscope. The second inspection, I said, well, if I were on the, back at the house, I would sample a few other areas. And I said, well, why don't I bring the microscope to the house? So that's what I did. And I've been doing it ever since for almost 25 years, uh, bringing a microscope to the house. I, I, we have less time these days because there's so many other things uh, to look at. We do so many samples in the house, 40 to 60 samples, but they're studied in house because I find with, when you have to send things to a lab, um, you can't do enough samples the lab fees just add up too much. So these are all studied in-house. There is one lab that I recommend, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But um, things led from one thing to another. Um, uh, as I learned more about where mold grows in houses, I developed a list of the, the uh, routine places to check. For example, um, could there ever have been a toilet overflow? And could mold be in the water, uh, in the water, in the, sorry, in the, uh, uh, the wall cavity? You, it's fairly easy to check that out. You can take a putty knife, put clear tape around it, uh, slide the putty knife under base molding, look under the microscope. You either see mold or you don't see mold, which is um, a clue about uh, that. Um, I work with culture plate air samples. Could there be mold behind, for example, uh, finished walls in a basement? Just go to an outlet um, and stick the sampler up at the outlet, bang on the wall and take your sample. And you pretty much get a clue as to what's going on behind the walls. Now, a little bit of mold can give off a lot of spores. So it's not, <clears throat> excuse me, definitive, <clears throat> sorry, not definitive of um, how much mold is in the wall cavity, but it's a clue that is worth uh, pers pursuing. Um, as I went on, uh, and, and incidentally, I have the list of where to check in the house if you were um, wanting to um, do, do my check. And I'll, I'll just briefly review them for you, but um, on the websites, I have the three websites, Teach Yourself Environmental Home Inspecting, because I'm trying to pass on to individuals what, uh, what they can do on their own. And maybe somebody will um, feel the call and, and start in this business themselves. There's so few out there using a microscope and it's the cheap tool to find something that's often invisible. Um, you, can, you can look and it looks perfectly clean surface and yet it can have high mold. So um, I, I've had different clients who have bought their own microscopes and uh, have, have worked with the master list of pictures that I uh, provide on the website. Um, I'm all for do-it-yourself and empowerment. 
I'm a former eighth grade science teacher, and um, I'm the, the uh, I, I want to see people that can learn and carry on on their own without inspectors and lab fees and so on. Um, and then, uh, oh, I said I'd give you the list there. So if I went into a house, um, I would start to think, think uh, what the question is that you want to answer. A lot of people go for the spot on the, on the wall or on the piece of wood, and, and that's what they sample, the spot on the windowsill. Um, those are not the questions to ask. They're oftentimes they're just maintenance items. Go wipe it off, put a little borax on a sponge and wipe off the mold on the window. So that's just common cladosporium. It grows whenever there is um, condensation. It's on a refrigerator gasket, uh, on air conditioning coils, which incidentally is why one reason why <coughs> UV light is not that, <coughs> sorry, why UV light is not that, um, uh, effective uh, other than the speed which the air codes pass but uh, any black molds have melanin in them which protect them from sunlight so and, and sunlight has the UVC so putting UV light on the mold just you now mold can just light up with the UV light it, it's uh, protected against it um, so the places I would check where does the water go inside sink cabinets so you sample inside them um, uh, under base molding around water. I mentioned the toilet already. I would <clears throat> also check it by the uh, dishwasher, by the refrigerator, under sill plates and exterior doors, um, uh, under common walls with showers if you can't get into the shower access. Um, <clears throat> uh, other places that mold might grow uh, are in the basement because it's a damper area. Um, with three tapes, I can, <clears throat> sorry, having trouble with my voice today. <clears throat> with three tapes, I can pretty much diagnose a basement, an unfinished basement. Tape on ceiling joists, a tape on subflooring, and a tape under the bottom step. Um, those are the places where mold would grow. Um, and uh, contents, you can do, I can do a, uh, a composite sample, touching the tape to all the furniture in one room and looking under the microscope and seeing if there's mold growth there. Um, attic, uh, again, the big questions, where is mold and where isn't it? Uh, the spot might, might tell you something. There are different patterns of mold growth in an attic. If there are not enough um, uh, ventilation, you might find mold growing up where rafters meet the roof decking. That would be aspergillus. That might be a remediation project, although um, I have had clients that have had do-it-yourself approaches on that, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, it's, as, it's as important to know where mold isn't as to know where it is. So I, I would sample, that's why we call them controls. Um, what, what is the control area? It shows whether you, know, you need to remediate the whole basement or just a spot. So those are pretty important things. Um, so that, that led to um, talking more and more with, with um, homeowners and renters and I, I would find people that are interested in this type of uh, service, this type of exploration. They either live too far away from me or more likely uh, they, they just couldn't afford an inspection. So I uh, started um, uh, an in-house uh, modest fee review of tapes under the microscope. People send me tape samples and I look and, and uh, give them a little report, either there is mold and there isn't or there isn't mold. And I'm giving them the guidelines of these 20 or so places to check um, that, that they can find the mold. And many times I've said, you know, in your area, uh, if you are having an inspection, you, you may not have an inspector who uses a microscope. So you can augment the inspection by just sending me the tape samples and having them do the, uh, the routine test on, on site. So that's kind of the way my business developed. Um, I, uh, I did say that there was one lab that uh, I do recommend, and that's for the air conditioning system. A lot of inspectors do a tape sample on the coils or take a look and they see some, some platysporium and they think that's, um, that's uh, assessing the air conditioning system. There's bigger fish to fry with the air conditioning system. Uh, I do recommend a test with the same technology of the ERMI test, but it's, it does more for less money. 
So I'm always in favor of that. And that's a test by Assured Bio Labs. The website is assuredbio.com. And it's the big two test. You, you click under do it yourself, DIY tests and go to the big two. And it's the $85 version. So I would swab on the underside of a supply vent and that gives us a clue as to what's coming downstream. We take the, the mold species that are included. Um, you get a, gen, a genus scan for Aspergillus penicillium. That means it stands for 400 species compared to fewer than 20 with Army and two with Hertzman. So 400 is, is about the best you're gonna get on that. And then I've, uh, it, it, I also add in the three species that are water loving, which would point to a drainage issue or a humidifier gone bad with the AC system. So we have Stachybotrys, Trichoderma, and Chytomium, and then Cladosporium, of course, which is the most common in air conditioning systems. Based on those results, again, it's just a clue because there are many variables when you're doing a swab sample and when you're working with somebody's air conditioning um, supply vents. Um, it, it, but the clue might give us numbers that are so high that we know there's something going on. And, and if there's something going on, uh, routine um, cleaning is not going to get to the source because the source is likely to be in the air handler and it's not accessible to a, a duct cleaner. So it probably would mean that you'd want to change out the air handler around $1,500 or so and, um, and then clean the rest of the duct work. If you have duct work that's um, flex duct and the numbers are pretty, pretty high, um, then, then you have um, an issue that, that might have to be changed out because flex duct cannot be um, adequately cleaned if it has many mold particulates in it. So that's kind of an overview of, of um, my service. Uh, and then we also, because it's not always mold, um, scan for other things as well. And this is all written up again, free, free information um, and what, where are some low cost equipment that you can use on your own at home. Um, it, it's written up at the teach yourself environmental home inspecting.com. Tell you a quick little story, a townhouse, a hundred year old townhouse that I inspected. So the guy, um, knew that his symptoms were related to the townhouse. He didn't have them outside, he had them inside. Brain fog, couldn't sleep, headaches. Those were the three big ones. So mold, so he had mold remediation done. Symptoms didn't change. And what I did was, uh, he, what he did, he found me somehow and called in. He said, I think I need a microscope. Um, there's mold here that hasn't been found. So I came down, 100 year old townhouse, you know, that, that's, usually low risk for mold because it's, and it was renovated because uh, the old wood is not as conducive to mold growth as the new wood, the softer wood products. Um, so I didn't, I didn't find any mold. In fact, I'm not so sure he needed the remediation to begin with. Um, I, so I said, well, if it's not mold, maybe it's gas leaks. So I checked for gas leaks, nothing. Um, if it's not mold and gas leaks, maybe it's formaldehyde, nope. And then I went back to him and um, I said, turn off your modem, which was maybe seven feet from where he was sitting. Turned it off, the pressure in his head lit up, and he called me the next week. He said, my symptoms are gone. I can sleep, no headaches, and I can think. And, and it was the EMFs in that case. I remember being at a conference on mold with um, Eckhart Johanning. Some of you may remember that name from, um, um, he, he does assessments of people that have been um, damaged by mold. Um, and speaking with a woman from Canada Mortgage after one of the second sessions, and I said, you know, there's a dozen, in, dozen um, researches, research uh, projects that have confirmed increase of the permeability of the blood-brain barrier um, in the presence of electromagnetic fields. And I said, you know, mold gases. And I remember, Eric, you wrote something about some of your worst exposures years ago were mold gases. Um, the, uh, that's, that's a big one. And she said, you'll never hear anything like that here. She said, in America, you measure. In Canada, we help people. You know, and that, that has um, 
I, that has, I've taken that to heart in my company, you know, just to help people um, to listen and, and uh, make suggestions, not only for what can be corrected, but what, is, what does a healthy house look like? And keep it, keep it simple, you know, keep it simple. Um, a lot of things that you can do on your own to make things better and so on. So that's, that's kind of the evolution of my business. And um, it's not something that um, I, I work as an expert witness. I'm not skilled in that area. If somebody has a lawsuit, I'll refer them out to someone else. Um, this is for information for the, um, the client only. Um, it, it's on-site information. They, in fact, um, we, we have a social event uh, when we have an inspection. Um, I, yesterday I was at a house and, and the woman was, uh, took the radio frequency machine and, and she found the sources of radio frequency, found high levels at, at her child's uh, sleeping area and was able to trace it down. What was going on, the sources happened to be um, the television, which could have been unplugged, the, um, the modem, of course, and a, a wireless uh, printer. Um, and then her husband was doing the air samples, I was doing the tape samples, and then uh, we, we switched when those things were done and they did the vacuum cleaner and the t sample for bacteria and drinking water while I was going down checking for gas leaks. And, and you know, it, it, they learned so much more that way and we can cover more territory in less time, but it's still six or seven hours at an average house. So it's, um, it's a real um, community project and uh, a lot of fun. Often, it's a more, not if some bad findings come for your house, it's not so much fun then, but, um, but they have tools for the rest of their lives with um, a healthy home 101. Thank you for that explanation, May. I can really appreciate that you care to offer lower cost sampling services for people who just need verification that they could be exposed to something that's causing their illness. Because mold illness doesn't seem to be widely understood or widely accepted, I think just having access to be able to verify that mold is in your house and it could in fact be affecting your health for for not a cost of $7,000 or $13,000. I think that could really help a lot of families who, who have water damage and they have kids with PANS or autoimmune conditions or other family members that are sick and, they, and they're saying, could there be mold here? Could this be making me sick? And then some of these inspections can be so high end that it, it's not really a practical starting point when people just need to know just have a simple verification. So thank you for, for offering that service and making some of this information more accessible to families who are obviously in great need. I'm sure Alicia and Eric are going to have some questions about your services. So I'm going to just hand it over. Well, lately the uh, CDC has been focusing on um, Aspergillus versicolor. Do you have any experience with that? Oh, it's very, very common. Uh, but if you Whatever the mold is, because there's so much they don't know about mold, we aim for zero tolerance with mold growth in a house. Um, and my, my sense is if you make the environment unfriendly to mold, you're also making it unfriendly to the rest of its cousins, the bacteria, the actinomycetes, and, and so on. Um, how do you make the environment unfriendly to mold? Well, we start in the basement and um, I'm a big proponent. I have been, ever since I learned about, I began to learn about mold. I, I can remember saying when I took the um, original mold inspector course just to, um, uh, just to have a credential on that, even though I'd been a mold inspector for some years by that point, he said, if I had research money, the first place I'd put it uh, in terms of prevention is uh, in, in encapsulations and coatings. What can you put on wood to keep mold from growing? Because we're, we're um, building our houses with something that mold eats. Uh, and uh, so I've been a big proponent of, of 
the sealant at the end, either as a precaution or at the end of the job, like let's say in the basement. Um, if it was a new house, I tell people paint every square inch of wood down here. And if it's not a new house and it, and it probably has some mold because it would be a minor miracle if you don't have some mold in a basement, um, then we basically uh, kind of make a judgment. Is this a homeowner's do-it-yourself job or is it a, um, a remediation job? And I have a great deal of respect for mold. Um, I've had thousands of stories over the years and some people are just super, super, super sensitive and they're the people who have to leave everything. Um, not everybody is on that level. Um, I, I went to a, a mold doctor that you would know the name um, years ago and was told based on my genetics, et cetera, that I'm the last person that should be a mold inspector. No, but it's not always the kiss of death. Um, your immune system may be strong enough. Um, my issue before I, I went to him was um, mercury toxicity from silver amalgams. And once I detoxed from that and got rid of the silver amalgams, my headaches left, I got my ambition back. And uh, if I had gone to a mold doctor nowadays with that complaint, of course it would have been mold, you know, but it wasn't, it was the mercury toxicity. And he said that once you, your body is stronger and your immune system is stronger, uh, you'll be able to handle the other things. And that proved to be the case. And I'm smart enough to know that, you know, it's not good to live amongst uh, mold and, and other pollutants and have a healthy home, but um, it, it's not always uh, the mold. Um, just lost my train of thought where I was going with that. Um, sorry, <laughs> left me about oh, oh, the, uh, the encapsulations. Yeah, so if it's not a um, if it's not a real bad situation where where you have visible mold, etc. Um, and and I'll tell you two two ways um, to kind of determine that um, as a homeowner. Um, then, then maybe it's a do-it-yourself job. So here, here is what I would do for a homeowner. Let's say you look, you look up at your basement ceiling joists and you see some discoloration. One thing is to touch it with a clear tape, hold the tape up to the light and see what you see. If you see nothing, it might just be a stain. If you see um, uh, crumbly stuff, it might just be dirt or something. If you see a film, then it could be mold. Another thing you can do is take a flashlight and hold it right against the wall um, and it will um, in parallel with the wall. Uh, and then you can better see uh, fuzz sticking up on the wall. So a couple of things, if it's not a big area and you think you can handle this yourself, uh, just get some, uh, you can get a bottle of 12% hydrogen peroxide on Amazon for $12, $15 and spray it. That'll just make the mold dissolve if it's just a few areas. Um, and, and then you could do your paint every square inch of the basement step because if you see some spots, there's probably low levels of mold elsewhere. Uh, I know that this is a controversial issue in, in the mold circles about painting. Um, but number one, you want to protect vulnerable surfaces. So painting will protect them. Um, and what if you cover some mold? The paint has a mildew side in it. It will kill the mold. I've heard for 25 years, oh, mold could grow back. You have to scrape it off. You have to sand it off. You have to wipe it off, whatever. Uh, low levels, I've never seen that happen, you know? Um, and it just, just paint over it and, and uh, uh, be done with it. Now, then the question will come, well, aren't you scattering mold particulates? I'm going to tell you about a, um, and the answer, of course, is, is to some degree, yes. So you want to handle these areas as gently as possible. But I want to tell you about a, a story that, a um, little experiment that a client of mine did. So I did the inspection. We found mold on the surface of one room, and it was, it was big enough that it was a remediation job. So she hired the remediator. And we knew that there was going to be some cross contamination because it was a, it was the surface mold and had been going on for a while. So the remediator said, you really should have this whole house um, cleaned 
and you know he quoted a few thousand dollars to do it so she and i talked and uh she decided she wanted to try it herself you know didn't know if it's going to work but she wanted to try it herself so she did this big two test and her numbers for aspergillus penicillin like the room right next to the remediated room they were like 52,000. I mean, they were up there. This isn't spores, of course. This technology gives you, um, um, this technology gives you um, the spore equivalent. So if a spore dries out and disintegrates into 50 little pieces, um, it counts as 50 on the PCR test, on the ERMI test, or on the big two test. You know, it just dawned on me. I'm having trouble with my voice this morning and I, I know exactly what it's from. Uh, I was at a house yesterday, they had a wood stove and that's what smoke does to my voice. <laughs> so I lose my, my ability to speak really well and it, uh, it's catchy, it's dry and so on no matter what I drink. Um, so smoke is one of my, my uh, problems and has been since childhood. So this woman um, got her readings. The Stachybotrys readings were 5,000 and the as, as pen, I think I said somewhere around 52, 62,000. High, high readings. You would really think that you need to have this room remediated. So she did um, four rooms, and um, they all showed elevations. And her cleaning was um, not what you would think would be needed. She hired a commercial cleaning company because they had ladders. And she gave them extendable mops and some spray to put on. So they went up and down the, the walls and the ceiling, got that done. And then she came in and she said, I don't think they even had to have a vacuum cleaner. Oh, this, is, this is heresy. Um, and then she came in with her, her, her HEPA. She didn't have a fancy one, it's just a basic shark. And she did the final cleaning. Um, and then she waited a bit and then she retested. The numbers were amazing i mean i wouldn't have guessed this they went for s pen they went from fifty-two thousand down to 180. stacky botches went from five thousand down to non-detect and there were uh two rooms were excellent like that two rooms weren't so good and when we talked about the two rooms that weren't so good um she realized what she had done wrong she had not cleaned the tops of window frames and um and yet she forgot that she hadn't cleaned them, so she went and retested them. So two of the rooms had some old dust included in the readings. And, and it was a lesson. I mean, there's two lessons here. One lesson is to give hope to people what their, clean, their own cleaning can accomplish. And the second lesson is how much a small area of old dust can skew the report num numbers. And that was a lesson because where are we told to sample with the army test? Old dust, you know, under refrigerator, on top of the, on top of window frames, and so on. One of my clients who's mold literate was looking for a home, and he sampled. He did armies on 25 houses, and he's mold literate. He's not choosing crappy houses. Uh, he thought these were all good, and <clears throat> the army test failed on 24 of the 25. And the only one that had passed was new construction. So that, that tells you that these tests can be useful, but we need to uh, understand what we're getting and, and where to sample with them. Um, so that, that uh, was, a, was a lesson. So she just went back and had to reclean her, her window frames and, and she should be good to go. So she saved herself some thousands of dollars. She's, said the remediator had wanted 3,000 to clean the house and she ended up paying 300 between the, um, the other ones. And, and then I also had another fellow, now this was an unused attic, so it wasn't such a, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a living area, they didn't store things up there, there was no HVAC, HVAC up there. And he um, decided he was going to address the Aspergillus himself. And he sent me before and after pictures, which are posted on the website. Um, so he used 9% hydrogen peroxide. He bought himself a gallon of 27% cent at a swimming pool supply store, $25. Cut it down to um, 9%, two to one dilution. 
and sprayed it directly on the mold. I mean, this mold was like not marshmallows. This was not, not, um, <laughs> this very uh, happy mold up there. And, and it disappeared. There was a white stain left behind. And he showed me those pictures before and after. And he said his next step, he was going to paint it. And, and he was done. I mean, he saved himself thousands of dollars on an adequate ad 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 remediation. Is there mold in mold spores in the insulation? Of course there are. I mean, he, he wasn't doing um, a remediation level cleaning, but it was a good enough cleaning for an unused space that most likely had was not having um, health effects for him. Uh, and and uh, it, it, it met his needs. It wouldn't meet everybody's needs, it met his needs. So it's, it's just um, like, like you said, Keely, before, you know, the people out there have, have just been so, in many cases, traumatized by, by the mold illness and the doctor bills and, and the inspection fees and everything. And, and um, we're just trying to give them alternatives. It's, it, you know, it's not always the uh, Rolls Royce alternative. It might be the do it yourself one. But if you can't do what you must, you must do what you can and, and try to give information in the way that is the most practical uh, and, and safe for, for folk as well. And not everybody can do this. I mean, I, I just want to underline that if, if you are really, really sensitive, you know, be careful um, on, on uh, your approach. You may need a professional remediation. And I want to speak a minute about that too. Um, I remember being on the phone with one client and uh, she had moved to a healthier place after being in a moldy place. And uh, she was very, very sensitive. Um, somebody, uh, uh, her friend brought in a box of something from the old place and unwisely opened it in front of her. And within minutes, she had lost her ability to speak and she was on the floor in convulsions. So, you know, we have to have a great deal of respect for, for these particles, as Dr. Shoemaker has taught us. Many of them are inflammogens, and, and especially with stachybotrys, whatever we're reacting to there, um, we have to take that, that seriously because people can lose their homes and their, their possessions over that. But um, it, I, I, I put this um, decision of how to approach your house on a triangle. I can give data, it's, it's your situation. You may have the money to follow the data, you may not have it, um, and, and the doctor's input. I don't know your immune system status and your health and, and putting all those three together, try to find a, um, an approach that gives you peace of mind and, and is the best for your, your family and your circumstances and, and your health. Mm. Well, lately, Dr. Shoemaker is telling me that my focus on stachybotrys was all a mistake. Mm -hmm. That the problem is actinomycetes and not stachybotrys, and I probably never should have looked into it at all. <laughs> well, I can, I will tell you a quick little story. I, I am mold sensitive. Uh, maybe every two or three years I get a, a wallop from somebody's house. Um, so this woman had one of these um, corner kitchen sink cabinets. It's hard to crawl in there and get to the back. <coughs> I'll do it for you. I, she said, I know there's some mold in the back. I'll take a tape sample and go in there, which she did. And I, I wasn't thinking to say, if it's visible mold, just do the little edge of it. Don't, don't disturb the mold. So she came back with like two square inches of stachybotrys on the tape. And I felt that in my lungs for the next two weeks. I mean, it's like my lungs burn. So I, you don't have to convince me that um, you know, there's an issue with that mold. But you've um, heard my story, haven't you? I have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's basically what I did when I wanted to find out specifically what mold was doing this to me, is I took a tape lift of stachybotrys, took it out to the desert, and that alone could recreate my symptoms just exactly as you say. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, um, what, for Actina Mycetes, I heard another lab saying, another lab director saying, well, we have those on our bodies. So. I, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't get into a lot of testing because if you change the environment, you, you've dealt with all of those things. I do point out um, uh, two sources of actinomycetes can be, one is cool mist humidifiers. Um, don't use them at all. Uh, go to either warm mist or steam humidifiers if you have to have a humidifier. 
and the other can be air conditioning systems. And I, I think that that is a neglected area in the mold industry, the AC. You know, um, that's a real important, those are the lungs of the house and we need to set them up in a way that they are self-sustaining. Tell you what I recommend, I've already talked about the, um, how to test them and how to keep the, um, um, how, how, how to deal with the air handler if that has to be changed out. So let's say you've, you've cleaned it, you've tested it and, and it's ready to go, it's in good shape now. How do you keep it in good shape? And, and how do you deal with um, another issue that's very, very important and I find in almost every house and that's elevated carbon dioxide. Um, it, not enough oxygen in the house, need for ventilation. So the ideal is to do um, pressure, uh, pr uh, positive pressure. So we work with April Air mostly because they're in industry leaders in this area. I don't, I mean, I don't work with them. I, I recommend them to, to my clients. Um, so you would, if you can envision a, a dehumidifier next to your HVAC system, you have a tube coming from, a duct coming from the outside. It brings in fresh air, it filters it, um, it dehumidifies it, and then it passes it by another duct into the return area of your air conditioning. So now you have filtered, dehumidified, fresh air coming through your system out every duct, and, and you have the whole system dehumidified, so you're not going to get future mold growth. And that sets up your, your unit and your house for um, de filtered, conditioned, dehumidified air. It's about the best we know. And, and I tell people, you go to your HVAC com to company and um, say that you want this. And they say, oh, you don't need that. HRV is better, heat recovery ventilator. And, and um, it's cheaper to run, gives you better air exchange. Well, those things are true. But the problem with it is it doesn't dehumidify fresh air coming in. So you get mold growth in the ductwork, you know, and that, that is not widely known. So we don't recommend HRV for that reason. If they can fix that problem, well and good, but um, any fresh air coming into your house should be dehumidified or you're, you're asking for um, a higher risk of mold growth. Okay, I'm curious about something. You mentioned uh, that you got a certification from the original mold inspector, was that the Eastern New York Regional Occupational Health Center? No, no, that was the conference I went to, uh, Joe Hanning's conference. Um, my certification was, um, I don't remember who now, but um, a, 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 the um, with indoor air quality uh, group, uh, I, IACAC or something like that. No, that's the carpet people, that, not, that's not where I have certification from, but it's a national certification with the indoor air. So I started out with mold inspector certification and, and I have the CA, the uh, council certified um, microbial consultant, CMC. Yeah, I was just wondering where they got their certification, where they derived their authority to talk about mold. Well, if, who knows? <laughs> who knows? They can say that for just about everybody in the industry, I think. It, it seems to me that these people are just printing up certificates when they haven't really researched the history of their subject matter. Do you know, um, this goes back years and pro <clears throat> excuse me, probably before they, um, they knew as much as they know now about mold, but we're still in the wild, wild west when it comes to mold. Just uh, let's talk, go into that troublesome area of mycotoxins in houses. Um, I have more questions than I have answers. Uh, I can just tell you that um, I find it curious that of the two labs that, um, that I know of that will do dust samples for mycotoxins, the, instruction, the instructions are opposite from the two labs. And one lab says we don't find them very often, one lab says we do. And I don't know if the, um, the places that they tell people to check might have something to do with that. Um, do, you, do you sample visible mold or don't you? Um, we know that exposure does, uh, that um, presence does not equate to exposure. So if something is not volatile and it's um, <clears throat> in a wall cavity or 
in a basement storage room or something, um, if mycotoxins are there and they're not volatile, would you be exposed to them? Not that they, not that there aren't other parts of mold that are significant too and should be cleaned up, but talking about mycotoxins. So I have had maybe a dozen, 25, 25 people who have tested high in the urine test and, um, and wanted for peace of mind to sample their homes for mycotoxins. And we talked about it, and, you know, decided that maybe sampling visible mold isn't the best judge um, sample where you're exposed. And 25 out of 25 have been negative, have not found um, mycotoxins. So then I thought, well, let me write up a protocol just in case mycotoxins are there. What would that protocol look like? So I said, well, call the labs and see what they recommend. And what I've learned is that one lab that certifies products says, well, we've only certified one product and it's a proprietary product, so it's not available to the public, it's used by a mold remediation company in Florida. Um, and that's all we've certified. And another lab says, well, we've certified a product too. And, um, and both labs say what their certification pro process is. It's a test tube process. Um, and, and then I say, well, what's the field experience? Um, don't have any, you know, and <laughs> this is the state of our industry, you know, enough to drive you nuts. Um, so what do I know? You know, I'm, I'm hearing people coming to me saying I'm throwing everything out because the mycotoxins. Where are they? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, well, you talk about the mycotoxin issue being very controversial. And back in the 1970s, mycotoxins weren't even known when the sick building industry developed this concept of there being something in sick buildings, it was all chemicals, Legionnaires disease, no mold. In fact, mold wasn't even discovered until the 1980s when Dr. William Croft was investigating a house in Chicago, whole house full of sick people, and he had Bruce Jarvis test for toxic mold, trichothecenes, and because Jarvis knew about stachybotrys, he was astounded that the high levels of trichothecenes had gone undetected. Mm, so this is really the first human health effects from toxic mold in the literature. This was 1986. Mm. And prior to that, mycotoxins weren't even known at all. So these um, people who are issuing certificates for indoor air quality were doing so on the basis of chemicals and Legionnaires disease no knowledge of mold, and when mold was finally discovered, they started acting as if these certifications applied to mold when they had no knowledge, they hadn't even looked into it. Interesting, interesting. So you that's know, why I ask about these certifications, because a lot of them are based on a, a false premise. Yeah. Can I interrupt yeah. for one second? Yeah. Eric, could you also please explain to her what Dr. Strauss said about that one test that could find the concentration of mycotoxins and how that's not available and also maybe exudate? Because I think people get a false sense of security checking their dust, and that's not the only place you'd find them. Yeah, Dr. David Strauss, who um, investigated the Melinda Ballard case, who got sick on the spot. <laughs> And permanently, you know, I guess he lost his hearing and he had all kinds of health effects from just going into that house for a short period of time. He realized that the uh, testing methods weren't correlating to people's sickness. So they concentrated vast volumes of air to bring up the level of toxins, concentrated toxins, to the point where they, their testing could actually find them because it turns out that these testing methods for um, trichothecenes, for mycotoxins, they're simply not sensitive enough to find these pathogenic levels that people are actually inhaling in the real world situation. Interesting. You know, there's also um, testing, you mentioned Bruce Jarvis a minute ago. Um, he has uh, co-authored a study that he, that I, I wrote this sentence down to bring here. I believe this was in the, around 2004, 2005. The principal mycotoxins that contaminate food and feed, and then he has in parenthesis, aflatoxins, fumonacins, ophrotoxin A, deoxynitrophenone,
carnelian, zeralinone, are rarely, if ever, found in indoor environments. So I don't know how to put all this together. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't list trichothecenes. That's true. <laughs> well, prior to the um, sick building incidents of the late 1980s and early 1990s, um, the only avenue for exposure to mycotoxins was ingestion. People didn't even believe that it was possible to get enough exposure in the air to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So that was the paradigm shift is from the early 1990s through the late 1990s, it was apparent that inhalation was a problem, whereas this is previously unreported. What, what do you recommend for cleaning up mycotoxins or for testing for them, for that matter? Um, I recommend nothing. I find that all the testing is unreliable. It's so uh, wrong that it's counterproductive, in my opinion. And the reason for that is when I did my uh, experiments with that sample of Stachybotrys, the experts were assuring me that if you remove the spores and fragments, your problem is gone. That's it. And, and my sensations didn't really fit that. In fact, I took some contaminated objects, uh, hard, non-porous objects, both plastic and metal, and I washed them, first using detergent and then going up to ammonia and bleach, and it had no effect. These still, still slammed me. So I thought, there's something wrong with this, this picture here. So I took that sample of Stachybotrys out to the desert and I walked into the wind so that I wouldn't contaminate the exterior of a HEPA vacuum cleaner bag, put it inside the bag, sealed it up with tape, and found that the effect came right through the bag. So this uh, idea that you could contain it within a, a HEPA system was not applicable to me. So I took this information to uh, Dr. Vincent Marinkovich, who at the time was the only mold specialist we had on the West Coast. There was Dr. Gary Ordog, but he wasn't really public like Dr. Marinkovich was. So he was the big name and I thought, well, I'll go straight to the top guy. And so I told him that this concept of testing for spores and believing that containment of spores deals with the problem was, was wrong. And he got kind of shocked. And he told me about a housing project in Sweden that he had just heard about where all the inhabitants were sick and all the testing found nothing, nothing at all. I mean, it was as clean as could be. And it wasn't until they busted open the walls that they found stachybotrys so tightly sealed within the walls that no spores or fragments, no, nothing detectable was escaping. And yet everybody was still sick. And so I told Dr. Marinkovich, there you go. That confirms it. Something is coming right through the sheetrock. It's not contained. We have to warn people that this air sampling and their testing methods are unreliable. They're not adequate. And he goes, you're right. But then it never went anywhere. Yeah. Well, there's also the question of the MVOCs. You know, what, what are people reacting to? Is it that? Uh, can, can chemicals uh, get through the walls? I don't know. I have a, a client like that too. She could be walk around a room and say, I feel dizzy here in this stacky botrys in the wall. Exactly. So yeah. that was my point. I go, there's something so specific to stacky botrys that we should analyze this particular mold. And of course, I wondered if it was the chemicals, the other things, the bacteria that I was being exposed to. Well, that was simple enough to test. I took my sample of stacky botrys to the desert where there were no chemicals. I was in a tent. Mm -hmm. I sealed it up inside a um, HEPA bag, you know, and mm -hmm. tried to make sure that I wasn't reacting to the bag. There was no problem with it until I put that stacky botrys inside and I found I could recreate my symptoms. So there I've isolated the substance without the, any other chemicals. That's mm -hmm. it, just the stacky botrys. Mm -hmm. So considering this showed up so many times in the sick building syndrome, and in the original cohort of chronic fatigue syndrome, to me, that's more than enough evidence to warrant serious investigation into this one particular thing. Yeah, yeah, I'd go along with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. So, so the question for me was, 
why wasn't this reported in the past? I mean, mold has been around for millions of years. So why is there no record of this? And when I looked at the places where stachybotrys was affecting people, where people were pointing at it, these were only the colonies that had access to fresh water. The uh, colonies that had been dried up and persisted in back rooms where there weren't water leaks, maybe it got going years ago, but it dried out, that hadn't really changed its value very much. People were complaining about mold to a certain extent, but the only places that really, really bothered them were areas that had lit up recently. And so this suggested to me that something was coming in in the atmosphere, getting into the water and feeding the mold something that it wasn't previously uh, using to process into a more pathogenic toxin. Mm -hmm. So with this model that something was feeding the mold and making it worse than it had been before, I applied this picture to people in buildings that were just recently having water leaks and they were complaining in ways that they'd never complained before. Mm -hmm. So I told the uh, chronic fatigue syndrome researchers that based on my observations of mold acting in new ways, they could expect to see, in my own words, millions of people pointing at mold. So here, that was 35 years ago. Hmm. And we've gone in that time from mold being completely unknown, disbelieved, you couldn't find any mold doctors, to now everybody's got a mold story, which suggests to me that my prediction that something was feeding the mold and making it worse fits the profile. Uh, well, that, that's so, but you also have tests that are convincing people that they've got a problem and then maybe they're connecting some of their symptoms with mold that may or may not belong there. It, it's a tough, tough business. And that's why I try to, as I said, keep it simple, make your house healthy, and then you don't have to worry about these things, you know, and, and that can be easier said than done. I understand that. but. Um, you know, not everything is mold. I, I've, um, at time to time, tried to kind of talk people down from the cliff because they've been so frightened um, what they hear in these chat rooms um, that uh, they're, they're almost immobilized. And um, one woman, I used uh, this um, four questions, uh, thework.com, and these questions can be very helpful. Now, this woman had lost um, two or three houses to mold before I knew her, so I don't know the situation. But I was inspecting the pre-purchase of the next house, and it was a good house. There was an area that needed remediation, and as soon as she heard that, she said, oh, you know, am I making a mistake? I'm buying another house that I won't be able to live in. And, um, and no amount of talk could, could uh, calm her fears or or help her to get past that um, hurdle. So I, I use the four questions from that website. One, state your belief. I'm afraid buying this house is a mistake. Um, second question, can you know that for sure? Well, no, I can't know it for sure. We could do remediation, all might be fine. Third question, how would you feel without the fear that buying the house would, without the thought that buying the house would be a mistake? I feel relaxed, we'd finally have a forever home for our family. And then the fourth question is grammatical turnaround. Buying the house would be a mistake because blah, blah, blah. Buying the house wouldn't be a mistake because blah, blah, blah. But when I turned it around to the house is afraid of me buying it, coming with my bad energy, she laughed and it broke the, broke the uh, tension. They bought the house. Um, they did the remediation. More mold was found than anticipated. They cleaned it up and they're happy, happily ever after. So it, you know, fear can play such a big part in so many people. Um, and, and they're getting these fears from the test results. Uh, like I said, you could, you could prove just about any house is uninhabitable with an army test, testing in you know, old dust, you know. Uh, yeah, well, the, um, you've got people, as you say, walking into a building and pointing at any water stain or any black streak and freaking out. 
Yeah. Well, thanks to my experience of having a bad um, effect, a bad reaction to stachybotrys, but not all of the other molds, mm -hmm. I never had any fear of any other molds at all. In fact, I go into moldy places all the time. Um, I scoop up mold with my bare hands. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't, in fact, um, I, I was um, going with somebody to a, a house and I stirred up some aspergillus on some wood with my finger and it's like, oh, I wouldn't do that. And I'm going, I'll, I'll eat this on my peanut butter sandwich. No, no, no. We don't want to do this, Eric. <laughs> well, well, I would because, you know, as a, a carpenter, um, I was chopping up wood and with firewood. I've got wood that's covered with mold. It never bothered me, never bothered me before. So I'm not going to worry about it now. So th th this has been a real advantage to me because I never had this fear of all these other molds, only the one particular sensation that I associate with stachybotrys. Okay. Yeah, I've heard that before, but aspergillus can be dangerous. It can grow in lung tissue, you know. In fact, the, the last year's Toxic Mold Summit, there was an ear, nose, and throat doctor interviewed, and he said, show me mycotoxins in the urine. I'll show them to you in the sinus tissue. I got a call one Saturday night. The guy said, you should know my story. He was an energy raider, and as part of his job, he was up, up um, closing off vents, uh, sealing them, taking measurements, whatever he does. And he had a headache start, and it was aspergillus growing in his brain, had an operation, left with epilepsy, he went to his lungs. He's on the highest level. Uh, at the, in those days, they, they called it the V-Bend. I, I don't know what that is, but it was an antifungal medication. So I have a healthy respect for other types of mold, too. And maybe you're fine, and I understand what you're saying. Well, I, no, I, no, no, you don't actually, because aspergillus is something we're inhaling all the time. Like the doctors say, it's everywhere. You can't avoid it. And the pattern that I saw is that people who had stacky botches in their house then were getting aspergillus infections. So this suggested to me that the stacky botches was such a powerful immune suppressor that they were getting infections that they wouldn't otherwise have. Interesting thought. So on that basis, I'm not going to be concerned about a mold that's everywhere, which can be infectious under certain circumstances, when if I inhale the immunosuppressive properties of Sacubotrys, then to all intents and purposes, I don't have to worry about these secondary things. It's, it's hard to prove something like that, you know? I mean, how can you prove that somebody had exposure to Sacubotrys at some point? Well, not, we can't do it without if they refuse to research it, but if you do a um, mental model, you know, a thought experiment of who gets Sacubotrys poisoning, who gets aspergillus poisoning and who gets mucormycosis or coccidiomycosis or uh, cryptococcus neoformans. It's amazing how people can be exposed to these things all the time without a problem, but put a little stacky botches into the mix and they're down for the count. Okay, so I, I can learn something from you, but I, I will come back to zero tolerance for mold. You know, if it's there, get rid of it. Because what the story, pe stories of people that have reactions to aspergillus penicillium are real. And I don't know their history, whether they've been exposed to stachybotrys too. That's not my business. The doctor or whoever, uh, you need a crystal ball in some cases for that. But I, I know that they're reacting to the mold in the house and I can deal with that, you know, if that makes sense. But that, that zero tolerance is actually part of creating the fear in people's minds. You look for the mold and get rid of it safely. Keep it from coming back. Well, because if mold is, now we've got people saying, well, it's mold on the trees, it's mold in the grass, it's mold, you know, and they are so freaked out mm -hmm. that they're paralyzed. They're scared to move. They're saying, don't bother to run from mold because you can't, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, I go completely the opposite way and go, the doctors are right, mold is everywhere. And to me, there's only a very few pathogenic strains and I can sense them. And so long as I worry about those, I don't have to bother cleaning any other mold. I'll scoop it up with my hands. I'll have mold in my environment. I'll have mold on the dirt. I'll have mold on my bread, on my cheese. I don't care. Okay, I hear you. <laughs> and funny. I believe that um, the, when, the more I look at these few really powerful molds, I find that they are so overwhelming that they open a window of vulnerability 
that wouldn't otherwise exist. But it's really made it simple for me because um, I don't have to clean anything. I don't have to vacuum anything. I don't wash anything. I don't worry about anything. This, this one particular sensation that I associate with stachybotrys is the only thing that I pay any attention to. Okay. Registered. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> but uh, the um, story that you had about the 100-year-old house, you know, people also have it so fixed in their minds that this is a problem that emerged in the 1970s after the oil embargo and everybody building tighter houses with more water leaks. Mm -hmm. Well, wait a minute, why is it lighting up in 100-year-old houses? And why is it in certain areas where nothing has changed since the 1880s? So that idea doesn't fit either. And now we've got people running from new houses or the people run from old houses because it's old, so it's got to grow mold, or it's a new house, so it's got to grow mold. It's like the ideas are so contrary, so confusing, so contradictory, that people are paralyzed with fear and they don't know what to do. Yeah, that's why, to me, keep it simple. Look for the sources, safely get rid of them. Make sure you have a healthy home. Go on with your life. Don't make mold the center of your life. Yeah. Hmm. Well. Also, when I realize this is very confusing, and there's a lot to this, but my feeling that as a prototype for chronic fatigue syndrome, since this was reported in the original object and purpose of this syndrome, that when I approach a researcher, I shouldn't have to ask, ask twice to get research into this, let alone 35 years of wasted effort. <laughs> So I'm pretty upset at our research institutions when they're saying, no, we're the experts, we're going to inform you when their ideas are so confusing and so scary and so contradictory that they make no sense and they don't fit the facts. Yeah. When I started this business, Eric, my dad was the safety supervisor of a huge metropolitan gas company. And we were talking about uh, electromagnetics uh, with the power line issue back in the 70s. Um, and he said, he told me, he said, the smallest person can bring a lawsuit. They will bring the biggest legal guns against them because they don't want a precedent set. And maybe that goes for a lot of things, you know? That's why I come back to you. If, if you don't, if I don't take this responsibility for my own life, make the home as, as safe as I can with the, with the insight I have, you know, nobody else is gonna do it for me. Yeah, that's why my, my websites are do-it-yourself oriented. And, um, and, and we go from there, yeah. Yeah, yeah my uh, grandfather kind of told me a funny story. He said that back way long time ago, uh, natural gas didn't have that odorant in it. Mm -hmm. So there was no way to tell if you had a gas leak. And there were houses, he lived in San Francisco, and there were houses blowing up and gas leaks all the time. And mm -hmm. people didn't know about it. And finally, they introduced this uh, methyl mercaptans, the uh, odorant, which is a sensitizing agent. That's why we can tell it at such a low concentration, because it's, a, it's an irritant. And who knows what problems the methyl mercaptans is causing, because it does prime the immune system for a, a response. Mm -hmm. But the funny part is that people complained about it bitterly, because they said, well, the methyl mercaptans, that odorant, is causing gas leaks. I never had a gas leak in my house until they added that damned odorant. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, yeah. So the, yeah, the thought process is a little bit backwards here. And I see yeah. that same pattern with the mold, where people are blaming molds in general. I never had a problem with the mold. Well, maybe something did change. And I think we need to be taking a look at that. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions or topics you would like to cover? I'm looking at my list to see what I might have here. Um, uh, the, yeah, I think, I, I know um, I had an inspection a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the woman met me and, and this was a doctor referral, how I got to her house. She said, um, I had two inspections done already. 
I liked both of the inspectors I'd hired them ahead again. And by the time we finished with the microscope and all the other things that were done, checking the vacuum cleaner, et cetera, um, she said, I didn't learn one one hundredth uh, from them as what I've learned from you. And this is not to sell my services. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm trying to pass on what I've known, known on the uh, on my website. So I would just uh, encourage people to um, who want to do um, self empowerment to uh, spend some time there. Um, so May, you are spending six to seven hours with each client. Is that what I heard earlier, or was that was I mistaken? No, no, no that's it. Wow, wow, that's incredible because most mm -hmm. testers will come in your house and they'll spend a maximum hour, and that's if you're lucky, <laughs> and then they're out of there. So to spend six or seven hours, wow, that's incredible. And uh, another thing I'm really curious about is what is it that you're finding in your microscope analyses? What what's a common thing or, or, or mold that you constantly see under your microscope? There there are about a half a dozen that are really common. Aspergillus penicillin, very common. Um, markers for dampness for mold incidents, um, for water incidents rather. Um, I see a lot of cladosporium. Anyway, you have condensation, you're going to see cladosporium. Um, I see a lot of um, uh, stachybotrys and chitomium, um, very common as well. And the others would be uh, lesser alternaria, um, that sort of thing. Um, but on a breakdown, uh, Alicia, on the six to seven hours, so we might spend a half hour kind of getting oriented to the house, um, a tour, and what the symptoms are, what they might be related to. Uh, and then um, I would do maybe, um, maybe it takes two hours to do the, uh, the air samples. Now the, the homeowner is usually doing them, not me. Um, and I like the culture plate samples. I can study them at home for one thing in my home office. And I can also, um, um, use them for better diagnosis. Instead of lumping all the spherical spores into ASPEN category, we, we know if it's ASPEN or, or, or Aspergillus or Penicillium. We, we can sample wherever we want. Um, every room, every uh, room air purifier with carbon in it, um, every um, humid dehumidifier, they can get nasty, um, especially if they're in a moldy basement. Um, wall cavities at, at outlets below grade spaces, all of those places. And then I'm going around with the tape samples, um, every room again, whatever looks like, and, and a moisture meter, of course, whatever looks like it could be a source of mold growth. Um, these, it takes me another day to go through these and write a report for people. So it's, it's kind of a two day project on a house. And, um, and then we do the, the swab sample on the AC, uh, and then um, electromagnetic fields. So what we're doing there, magnetic fields, of course, everybody you know checks that. Well, anybody who's in, in the EMF field. Uh, but we check the voltage at the beds, because that has been associated with um, bedwetting and uh, sleep issues. So what can we do to reduce that? And that, that's printed up on my website. That's uh, Create Your Healthy Home and just go to the um, EMF tab and body voltage. It'll tell you how to do it. You can do it for under $100 in equipment. Um, and uh, then we also do the Wi-Fi and that, um, I had already mentioned that. And then check the vacuum cleaner, check the uh, products in the house, um, the laundry products, the cleaning products, <clears throat> going from least toxic products. I mentioned the carbon dioxide levels they're, they're important because they, they more than anything convince people of the need for ventilation. Um, with carbon dioxide, the levels outside are typically under 500. Average house, 1,000. Um, I've seen as high as 2,200 in a really tight house with several adults in it. Um, and this is areas where you can feel sluggish and just not yourself. Um, so that, that's a big ticket item. Um, we use a laser particle counter, not only for the vacuum, but also for the um, what's coming out the vent. Uh, yesterday, the house 
Um, the inside levels were something like 12,000 particles um, per, per um, size of molds fourth and bigger uh, per cubic foot. And when we checked the back, the, the um, what was coming out the vent, it was like 17,000. So there, they needed not only an upgrade in the filter that they had, but they also needed to um, to eliminate bypass of air being sucked in from um, a basement in this case. Uh, and the way to do that is to take the filter out. They had a filter by the return. Put a flashlight or your cell phone in with the light on and uh, shine it and see where the light comes out in the dark. And then you know what has to be sealed because those those areas are allowing basement air to be sucked in after the filter and it's getting up upstairs. So little things like that can make a big difference. Um, uh, and we also men I mentioned gas leaks um, before. Um, bacteria in water, now they had a Berkey filter and Berkey's always, well, I shouldn't say always, um, the ones I've tested um, have had elevated bacteria. Maybe that goes with the territory with that Berkey because why wouldn't bacteria grow there? Um, but I haven't had anyone do a test on the bacteria. Maybe it's not a non-pathogenic type. Maybe it's pathogenic. I don't know. I just deliver the, the data, give them the options and see which way they want to go. Um, what else can I think of? Uh, those are oh, carbon monoxide, of course. Um, yesterday, for example, I, I showed the uh, homeowner a low level carbon dioxide met, uh, meter. Uh, it, it has uh, readings down to five parts per million. The ones that people have in their homes, don't, the alarm goes off around 30 parts per million. So you could be living in a low level of carbon monoxide um, uh, and not even be aware of it. Uh, this is True Tech Tools, Charizac, T-R-U-T-E-C-H. Um, and the man pointed to the one he had and it was plugged in. Um, and he said, is this okay? Well, it's not as sensitive but the other thing is it's plugged in and carbon monoxide is slightly lower, lighter than air. So you really should have it up by the ceiling. I learned this in a Brooklyn um, basement. It was a small utility room. I found a gas leak. So they called the gas guy in and I hadn't even checked for carbon monoxide yet. And he checked uh, the hot water heater and he picked up carbon monoxide. And I said, there's a, uh, there's a carbon monoxide detector like two feet from where he picked up this, this leak. Uh, or the, the um, source, and he said you would have to fill up the whole room before that would go off. So that's where I learned that lesson. And it turned out in Brooklyn that they had, a raccoon had gotten into the chimney and died there. So that was what was clogging it up, and they had a carbon monoxide uh, issue there. Um, but those are those are the um, main things. Um, I've also um, this is kind of straddling an area, but a lot of people don't have enough light in their lives. And this is an environmental issue. Um, found a, um, this is again, a do it yourself thing, uh, not to step on any doctor's toes, um, but this is um, a, a neurologist who studied 8,000 patients over um, 10 plus years in her business. And she, um, has found uh, some real interesting findings between D3 on a different type of test than is commonly done, which um, is not as accurate um, at, at higher levels and, and levels of B5. So that, that website is Dr. Dr. Gomenak, G-O-M-I-N-A-C. So, uh, um, light is just so foundational to health and, and our homes don't, particularly have uh, what we need on that. Um, so those are some of the things um, we, we, we never know what we'll find in a particular house. Um, never know um, just poking a tube down uh, along a pipe access beneath the sink cabinet might show something uh, of elevated mold levels. Um, one, one house, the woman said, I always react when I'm sitting on my living room couch and she was in a, a city apartment with the parquet flooring. And uh, I was there with the microscope when she, this was before we knew about containment and all those things years ago. Um, and just pulling up the parquet floors with the maintenance people, I tested until we got to the end of it. And, and it was aspergillus and penicillium. Um, so that was fixed and, and her symptoms went away. Um, uh, 
Another issue that um, should be mentioned is these mini split, the ductless um, systems that a lot of people are going to instead of, um, instead of central air, uh, finding mold in them. Uh, very difficult to clean them. One woman started put it for two units. It took uh, her heating contractor all day long, to, uh, all afternoon long to clean them. It was $200 a pop and to do that every year. Um, they, they just, um, they are now selling kits of pouring something through them, but I, I have no experience with that. So that's something I would be cautious about going into that realm there. Um, there's a very interesting website, uh, uh, if you Google Nate Adams Electrify, um, he's made, made a big study on um, electrification instead of um, fossil fuels with uh, the gas and the um, and the, then the oil, uh, gas stoves are, are certainly an issue. Um, Mother Jones last uh, summer came out with an article on the history of gas stoves, uh, and we don't recommend them. Uh, if you have to have a gas stove, try to get um, a, an exhaust to the outside over them because they are giving off all sorts of uh, nasties into room air. Um, attached garages, the studies that show over 80% of houses with attached garages have infiltration of car exhaust. Um, they're okay if the, the garages are okay if they're set up right, maybe seal off all the entries into the room air and seal up around the door and underneath weather strip, and then perhaps put a timer on uh, um, 45 minutes or so after a car comes and goes, um, that sort of thing. Um, watch the little Chernobyl areas in the house, um, the paint cans, uh, Jeff May and his book, um, My House is Killing Me, that's uh, the original uh, edition, I hope it's in the second one that came out a year ago, um, talks about putting, uh, when you're sealing a paint can, put plastic wrap over the top and then put the top on and, and uh, store it upside down so you don't get uh, gas uh, paint fumes coming out. Um, it's a lot that can be done, yeah. Awesome, thank you. And uh, you made a comment earlier about new wood being a problem versus old wood that was used in home building. Can you explain the difference and why new wood that's used today is more problematic? Well, for one thing, a lot of it is pressed wood and has a lot of formaldehyde in it, uh, or it may have formaldehyde. Um, one uh, researcher uh, estimated if you have a kitchen with let's say eight cabinets in it, and it has pressed wood shelving, figure you have 11 pounds of formaldehyde in that. And they've done, a, they did a study um, with old cabinets and found that it was still off gassing. So if you can do anything in a kitchen, do solid wood cabinets. Um, the pressed wood uh, is more, I, I would say, you know, it's, I, I don't know the, the wood industry, um, I find some wood has had a high level of mold on it. One man uh, in a new house, um, two-year-old house, he, he said, I can't go in this house. Um, he had to go in with a space suit on and he'd hired uh, the best company he could find in Jersey um, and they found nothing. Did, they tested from stem to stern. So somebody told him about me in the microscope and took him three months. He'd already had the best. Why does he want to hire somebody else? But I came in finally because he had no, no other options. And the whole basement ceiling, which was pressed wood, except for the, for the joists, um, <coughs> OSB, was, well, they might have been uh, OSB too, I don't recall. Um, but it was covered with aspergillus. And, and it didn't show up in the air sample. Um, it was bothering him. And uh, and that was um, that was the cause of it. And then I, I found stachybotrys a couple of places. His wife had over over watered plants um, upstairs, um, and they the water soaked into the wood floor, wood wood flooring. Um, also, the older pressed wood shelves, his shelves were covered with aspergillus, um, and the the newer ones. And this is why I brought up the story. The newer ones don't grow the the mold the way the old ones did. So I think they're adding something to this, these pressed wood products that may keep them from growing 
um, mold. Um, I inspected a, a new house a couple of weeks ago, and the only place I found some mold, <laughs> this was under construction, was um, on a door frame and um, a window frame, I think, in, in the basement, and then some that had come in on mold in the attic. Uh, that was mostly cladosporium, not so significant, and I suggested to the builder that he just spray it with the uh, higher percentage hydrogen peroxide and then paint it. So that's what he was going to do. Awesome. Um, yeah, you know, going back to what Eric was saying, how stachybotrys is the the medium, the the medium agent that is causing the the infections, the sensitivities, and that's why he feels, and also in our experience, why some people get uh, MCS, multiple chemical sensitivities, because the stachybotrys is actually just deteriorating, deteriorating the lung lining, allowing to uh, bring any chemical or anything that is not, you know, normal, anything that's man-made, and it begins to disturb the body or create allergenic responses. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of what we feel is going on. And something that you said earlier, I don't quite agree with. Um, and I, I don't think it's the best advice, but, you know, we can agree to disagree. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it, it <laughs> I don't think people should be painting over and spraying hydrogen peroxide. I think if there is water damage, maybe finding the source, maybe that's something that you meant to say and forgot to say, but um, I think it's very important to find the source first um, and, and to make sure that has completely stopped because I think if you're just spraying hydrogen and painting over it, you're going to keep having the same problem and you're going to have to keep doing the same thing. Um, and that's kind of what happened in my home um, when we had mold. We, you know, if we didn't, we didn't find the source, we were basically throwing darts at a move at a moving target, I guess you can say. So um, is that something that you still stand by, um, you know, spraying and painting? Or do you feel like finding the source and removing or stopping the leak and then removing those those materials with fresh materials um, is a better way of handling um, something? Uh, well, the, the context of what I was talking about there, I think was a a basement and that might not have a source you know basements are damper uh, i think every every bit of wood should be painted in a below grade space um and and that that yeah of course that that would be common sense to find the source and correct that uh before sure um but some things can't easily be um uh disassembled and and in some cases uh, people can't afford to even when they can so it gives another option yeah like i said i haven't had mold grow back um on, we're not talking about painting over visible mold you know not a lot of mold that's another issue um but um it's it's worked for me for 25 years you know i've never had um a house that i can remember where somebody couldn't um i mean some of course some people left homes you know that that's understood but I can't remember any where uh, a good remediation job was done that they couldn't stay there, you know. And um, um, and, and maybe that that's something to talk about. What is a good remediation job? Um, because in in 25 years in this business, I would I could count the remediation companies on on one finger that I really have confidence in, you know. And that's that's pretty sad. If I were looking for a remediator as a homeowner, I would know what I want done first, because there's a lot of gadgetry in this business. And um, somebody that comes in and fogs and thinks they're going to solve everything is, is a gadget, you know? Um, I was just going to ask you your thoughts on fogging, because we were sold that lie. And, you know, it just made everything worse. I actually it made everything so much more unlivable for me that I had to leave. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. stay home after the blogging event. So, yeah. Um, so you know, the the industry guidelines are find the deal with the moisture, find the source, clean, um, have a vacuum, clean, have a vacuum, and they may or may not encapsulate. Um, if somebody just follows that in a meticulous way, I mean, they do a pretty good job in general um as, as far as my my people that i've had experience with um one one 
woman had two local companies. Each one made it worse than the other. And she brought in uh, this, a company I had told her about. And uh, it took them a lot more to clean because such a mess had been made by the other two. But she was able to get back in her house. And that was industry guidelines. Um, we've all, we always work for people who are sensitive, um, meaning no, no chemicals. The chemicals that um, or the products that were mostly used um, I could tell you is again just basic hydrogen peroxide wiping down after HEPA vacuuming, and then um, they used a um, um, Cali well, which is online with Home Depot. It, it's uh, registered for remediation projects. Um, I do point out if you're really sensitive, it might not be the best first product for you because they do have a petroleum binder in it. And for those people have, uh, who could still tolerate latex paint, no BSC, I recommend uh, earthpaint.net. Um, they have um, some like Lime Prime, uh, which is probably like Caliwell without the uh, binder. And that's been good for them. If nobody, if they can't tolerate um, paint at all, then maybe just mix up some um, whitewash and, and paint that on. Um, that will last for a while. Uh, and and, um, and then the cleaning, final cleaning of the air and final vacuuming. Um, maybe start with a course of vacuum, something like the Euroclean GD930, and then and that's available for like $400. Um, it, it doesn't test really good with the particle counter because the filter is, after, is before the motor instead of after the motor. So you get motor dust coming off too, but it, everything that's picked up from the ground goes through the filter. Um, uh, then they might finish up with something like a Nilfist uh, GM80, which is um, a very good filter and, and cleaning very good that way. Um, things to avoid, as far as I'm concerned, is anybody that does their own inspection, remediation, and post-testing, post who knows what they're doing. They always pass their post-test, but it's very easy to pass their post-test. Um, I told a, a remediation um, um, supervisor years ago, I said, you wouldn't even have to remediate in here. Just set up your air scrubber, run it for a couple of hours and do a, an air sample right next to it and you pass, you know? So um, it, it's, um, there's a difference between the types of testing if you're on the spores. And, and I realize there are many particles of mold that are beyond spores, but um, spores are, are the kind of the industry guidelines. And they're also a surrogate for everything else. Um, if you have high spores, you probably got everything else going along with it. And if you have no, nothing showing up, maybe it's good. We, we strongly recommend and research supports this uh, aggressive testing, which is not setting up a tripod and taking a sample because mold falls down due to gravity. So why not uh, sample where the mold is, put your sampler on the floor and stir up the dust? Now, that's the way I sample um, to find the mold. Um, so that's it. Another other mm -hmm. thing to, to avoid are um, really um, uh, chemicals. That's you, one of you also already mentioned that. I had a house a man that had to knock his house down once because of what was used in his house. He couldn't tolerate it. They loved the property, so they rebuilt on the property. And the, the remedi he had warned the remediator this, and the guy said, "Oh, no problem with this. I don't, nobody reacts to this." You know, so. Yeah, you, you want to be careful there. Um, um, I have a question for you, mate. If mm -hmm. you walked into someone's house that was highly uh, sensitive, I mean, these people are, the whole family's extremely sick. Mm -hmm. um, you find a source. Would you recommend that they completely replace the materials or just spray and paint over it? It depends what the materials are and how much the mold is. Um, if, he, if you're talking about structural issues like this, the whole basement ceiling, you know, you, unless you rebuild the house, you're not going to do that. Um, um, so we, you, you really stuck there. You have to have a vacuum and maybe spray, maybe wipe, depends on the situation, and then paint. I mean, I'm always recommending an encapsulant to put on the end because that it does a number of things. It, it um, if anything's left. If any parts of mold are left behind, they get sealed in. And if they're like Caliwell, the encapsulant is, uh, is um, um, 
or what, what is it now? It's, it's the lime-based calcium hydroxide. So it's, it, you don't have to have a chemical uh, type of encapsulant. You could use something with calcium hydroxide, which is a white, whitewash and a no VOC paint base, essentially. So at what point would you tell a family that their home is unlivable? I never tell them that. Yeah, um, because I don't know the answer, you know? Um, there are things that they can do. And, and uh, I can, my job is to present the data, you know? And, and you decide what you're gonna do with that data. You know, it, it may be, um, I might say something like check with your doctor regarding continued residence until this is dealt with. You know, and then after successful um, testing, I mean, my, I'm not a doctor. I don't know their situation. And, and if they're that sensitive, they probably are out of the house already, you know. So. Yeah. So say if a family had consulted with you and they're utilizing your testing methods because it's so thorough as mm -hmm. evidence in the court of law for whatever reason, would you ever write a letter for them stating that their house is unlivable due to these circumstances after all the measures have been taken that you've recommended? I don't, um, I, I would pass them on, as I said before, to an expert witness. Um, and I don't know what they would say. Um, I can give them uh, informal advice based on my findings. Um, but I don't know when a house becomes unlivable to them. Um, I, I did, uh, I did a, a house, an interesting case. It was a rental out in um, Ohio. And they, they um, didn't have money to move elsewhere. And uh, a, a well-meaning person took the house. And um, it was like a, uh, not a foreclosure, but a flipper of some sort. And he, he did the best he could he even put wood cabinets in the um, kitchen you know, for rental. And yet I found um, evidence of hidden mold in wall cavities and ceiling cavities. And, and I suspected that that house probably should have been a knockdown um, be, rather than uh, renovated, uh, but he didn't know about mold. So he, he didn't know those things, but I'm not dealing, I'm not working for him. I'm working for the renter who can't move. So what do you do? You know, so I suggested, and, and some of the worst exposures were her own furniture, which she brought in, um, but she, she could get rid of those and then do a thorough cleaning. I suggested um, something like a Panasonic, for $400, they make an ERV. And I know I spoke against ERVs before, but this is a small one and it's, you could change the hose out, you can, you can maintain it, um, to try to make her area a pressurized fresh air area. Um, and that was, that was the only thing I could think of for those people. You know, I told her how bad the house was, but I was working for her to try to make it something she could live in since she didn't have any place else to go, you know? So that was an example of one that was, was just a house that shouldn't have been um, renovated. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, May. And, uh, you know, we're tough cookies over here. So thank you for being patient with our questioning and <laughs> our commenting. But if our audience members wanted to work with you and consult with you or find any information um, on the resources that you provide, where can they find that? Well, the websites, I mentioned a couple of them, createyourhealthyhome.com, teach yourself environmental home inspecting. Um, my wet, my Email address is may, M-A-Y, at createyourhealthyhome.com, and the phone number is 717-273-1231. Yeah, and I appreciate um, you saying that. Uh, you certainly know more than I do in, in different areas. I'm just a simple mold inspector, and I've got to find the mold and tell people how to get rid of it. So. Absolutely. And thank you just for being so gracious and so lovely. And we appreciate your, your attendance here. And um, I'm going to do the closing, but you don't have to stay on. So uh, you okay. can head out for the day. I know you probably have other things to do. So you take care, my dear. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> nice one, Keely. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We had May Julian. She is a seasoned uh, home tester. She tests for mold, bacteria, and EMF um, in people's homes. And she's been doing this for such a long time and just a wealth of knowledge. Uh, of course, you can see today we 
we agreed to disagree on certain things um, and that's totally fine. You know, we're, <laughs> we know what we've experienced and, and other people that we've talked to and, and she has her own experience. And so we're all bringing that experience to the table here today. So please check out our um, Patreon page. If you want to become a member, we have some really awesome things happening in our groups behind the scenes. Um, and also check out our website. If you want to consult with us or anything else, find some resources. Everything is there for you laid out. Uh, feel free to reach out and we'll see you guys next time.